Uh, I haven't talked at a testing conference for a long time, so this is, uh, this is a real treat uh, to see you all here. I always like seeing testing conferences where there are more people in the audience rather than less, uh, because, um, my goodness me, do we need testing. Um, I, you see up here, uh, my former title was, um, uh, I was a professor of forensic software engineering which means I spent my entire career staring at the failed computer systems. Um, it's no job for a grown man. Um, in that time, I was hoping things would get better, uh, but they haven't for various interesting reasons, uh, which I'll come to later. Um, so let me just sort of launch gently into this. Um, one of the things that you do when you work in forensic engineering is uh, I collect histories of failure, uh, why they failed. Of course, the whole object of this is to turn it into lessons that you can maybe deploy in testing to prevent it happening again. Uh, that was the old-fashioned view of engineering. Uh, now we just seem to rush to the next disaster a bit quicker. Um, so let me just introduce you to some of the things that I see will be challenges. Uh, for you, I, I'm semi-retired now, so it's, it's your problem. Um, so um, let's start off with a nice header slide. Um, I spend a lot of time looking at systems still. Uh, I don't get so involved as I used to do. Um, but when you see this sort of thing happening, uh, you begin to think, are we uh, just going a little bit too fast? Um, these are recalls in the automotive industry. I, I spent quite a lot of time working with uh, automotive software, primarily because there, there's so much of it. Uh, secondly, because it's uh, written to a marketing clock. Uh, and thirdly, it knows no bounds in its imagination as to what we might do. And as you can see in here, um, we have uh, record numbers of, uh, of recalls in software. A recall in software is really expensive in the automotive industry. Uh, a billion dollars is typical. Uh, so uh, it pays for a lot of testing, which presumably didn't get done. Um, as you can see here, we had uh, 189 distinct recalls in 15 years. Um, I should say a thing about the slides, by the way. I tend to put quite a lot on my slides because I know that most of you may not be English um, speakers and you can read it later. So, and I may not even say what's on the slides, so just to warn you, but it should make a complete story for you uh, when you when you look at it more leisurely. Um, we've had the first known self-driving death uh, in Tesla. Uh, and then uh, I have a long list of these anyway. Um, Another parameter in this is the current size of software systems. Uh, um, with um, uh, Michiel van Genuchten, I co-edit a column in IEEE Software. And in fact, I'll say now, if anybody is interested in writing uh, columns uh, for this particular magazine, please contact me. We're always trying to get case histories. Um, we've published about 30 so far in the last five years. And the typical sizes of systems that we see are um, uh, mostly in the 1 to 10 million lines of code uh, range. In automotive systems, it's in 10 to 100 million lines of code. Now, if you were to say to me, how do I test 10 million lines of code? I would say to you, go get another job. Um, it's not feasible. Uh, in fact, quite a lot of what we build today is not feasible to test in any reasonable sense. You just do your best. Um, how fast are these systems growing? Well, um, over the last few years with a, a couple of other colleagues, we, we actually looked at just short of a billion lines of code and we analyzed all the change records. Uh, it was a massive task. Uh, what we were looking for was to see if there was anything equivalent to Moore's law. Uh, Moore's law in, in transistors is that basically the density of transistors on a, uh, on a chip will grow at about, it'll, it'll double about every 18 months 
to two years. It depends on who you ask. Uh, we wondered if there was an equivalent for software. Of course, this has a direct impact on you in testing because the volume of software that you, must, you need to look at is ever increasing. How fast? Well, it turns out that the 95% um, the confidence interval straddles 20%. So it's a 20% plus or minus 2%. So if you're thinking how much code are you going to get next year, it'll be pretty close to 20% more. Almost whatever you do and in whatever discipline you work, uh, with the possible exception of safety critical systems where it appears to be about half that. But that's still a mighty load, especially in safety critical systems. Um, so these are fundamental properties of software systems which you need to know because you need to be able to size what you can do and uh, to see if it's feasible. Um, of course, in recent years, we've had the new phenomenon of software cheating, uh, where software is put into, in, into automobiles to uh, fiddle figures. It's not just the automobile industry. Everybody does it. They just got caught quickest, as it were. Um, but of course, one of the things that um, uh, my colleague and I were predicting uh, two or three years ago is, I bet they can't fix it reliably. Um, when Volkswagen first actually issued statements about this, they, they didn't seem to know where it was, who'd done it, and it wasn't us any, anyhow kind of thing. So um, when you try to fix something with possibly up to several million lines of code, as you will know as testers, you can't fix it reliably. Uh, there are side effects all the time in everything we do. And it looks like there's already bugs being introduced in some of these uh, models because they couldn't fix the cheat properly. Um, of course, um, this has all become tainted by security. Uh, when, uh, when we think about normal testing, especially if, it, if it's a high integrity system, you're worried about it failing. Is it going to kill somebody? Um, now we have to worry about overt attacks on these systems. Uh, uh, the Stuxnet uh, um, virus um, a few years back was a, a real wake-up call uh, for us. Um, and it seems to me that um, uh, many of our testing infrastructures, they're not really set up for this mindset that people are trying to break into even such a thing as a humble automobile system. And of course, um, this all started back in 2015 when uh, hackers remotely killed a Jeep on the highway. Uh, th there was no driver in it. They, they, uh, well, there was a driver in it, but they told him it was going to happen so he would have time to, uh, uh, to, to bring it to a halt. Uh, they then took the Jeep and put it in a car park and showed how, through, by getting in through the navigation system, they could reverse the Jeep into a ditch, which they did. Uh, 2016, they were back um, with a, a whole set of new interesting ways of hacking an automobile. And 2017 is, uh, is to me, a hallmark. Um, uh, in August this year, researchers actually managed to hack a self-driving car. And the way they did it was they pasted um, uh, sort of QR codes over road signs. Of course, a self-driving car is reading all the signs. <laughs> and it managed to read a virus into the system, and they actually uh, took the car over. Uh, are you worried about this? Because I'm, I, I am. Uh, I think it's bad enough as it is without having this sort of thing going on. Now, I don't know how much code autonomy will add to a vehicle, but there's, this, this is a, a, a system which already has um, perhaps uh, 50 to 100 million lines of code. And there's a whole pile of code that we put in and all these sensors and all these things that we have to imagine in a test case that might happen. It seems to me we're pushing the boat out just a little bit. Um, so that's kind of an introduction. Um, I want to sort of develop something called evidence. I'm sure you all know what that is. Um, one of the things that I've observed in, um, uh, certainly in software engineering, software testing, is a massive explosion in the bureaucracy of carrying out these things. Uh, we've already seen Lloyd uh, taking a number of things that maybe we all thought were sacrosanct and saying, well, actually, 
is there a value in this? And uh, I completely agree with him. I don't think there is. In fact, there's no real value in any bureaucracy which is not evidence-based. It's simply opinion. Uh, let me develop this a little bit, uh, and I'll give you a bit more about the bureaucratic urge, as I see it. Uh, this is a, a picture of the role of evidence compared between science and politics. In science, evidence leads policy. That's the idea, anyway. We call it the scientific method. Um, in politics, opinion leads policy. This will mean, uh, politicians don't seem to understand this, uh, improvement is random. Uh, all you get out of a system which is driven by opinion is what's, what uh, statisticians call a drunkard's walk, <laughs> very appropriately. Um, where is testing on this spectrum? Where is software engineering on this spectrum? Well, uh, I'm afraid we're over on this side. And the reason is because if you compare uh, this evidence matrix across different areas, uh, if we look on the uh, top row of the table, uh, I've taken an example area of classical engineering. Um, the levels of evidence are irrefutable. Um, you can't argue with the laws of physics. Well, you can. Uh, but you tend to lose. Um, if we drop down a row, I've, I've uh, introduced an area, medicine. Now, medicine, you might think, is irrefutable like engineering, but it isn't. Medicine is, subse is susceptible to media and political in in interference. I'll give you some examples of this. Um, some notorious incidents where the medical world has effectively been overridden by idiots. Um, so, in, although we have a considerable level of evidence in medicine, uh, it's not actually free of interference. And then we come down to the bottom, I just thought none to little. And I'm afraid, um, uh, after all the years I, I've been around software systems, we've made so little progress here. Um, uh, uh, as uh, Lloyd said, uh, managers will often negotiate with you about how long something's going to take. I find that insulting, because what it says is that software engineering has no relevant basis. Um, it's partly right, but that's our fault. Um, if we want to provide advice which is irrefutable, like normal engineering, we'll probably have to wait a few more decades. But the important thing is that as it stands, decisions made in software systems be the testing, development, or anything else, are overridden primarily because the CEO uh, thinks that everything is the same as Excel on his desktop. You know, how hard can software engineering be? I can add two, I can add two columns up in a spreadsheet, yeah, and I can change them. Look at that. It must be easy. Well, you all, you all know that's rubbish. But that's the impression we give, and we've given it in many years in education by... Um, by by teaching school children that, that uh, spreadsheets and writing a web page is computer science. Uh, I hope we'll recover from this, but it certainly hasn't happened in my career. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the bureaucratic urge, because it's relentless. Um, it comes in various forms. Um, you see a proliferation of documentation. Um, and then you get the panic in proportion. Something must be done. And then finally, we've got risk assessment, which is a frightening new weapon in the battle against common sense. I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a moment, but proliferation of documentation. Um, these are human interface standards. They're all ISO standards, uh, which you have to work with. I'll just leave it going for a couple of minutes. It's quite hypnotic. Oh, that's a good one. Nearly there. Well, actually, we're not nearly there, but these are just the ones I could fit on a slide. Are we there? Oh, no, there's another one. <laughs> um, what's going on here? Have you ever wondered why human interfaces are so bad? with computer systems, it's because of this mess. 
what we're doing is we're laying down layer after layer of totally pointless rubbish, which has no engineering in it at all. Quite a lot of these ISO standards actually conflict, but you get things, oh, I, I wrote it to ISO 13406. Oh, well, I did it to 185. This, with respect, is not engineering. This is a danger of this, uh, and this is in a safety critical system. It shouldn't have happened, and it did. It was the explosion of the RAF Nimrod in Afghanistan in 2006. I'd just like you to note, and maybe read later, all the safety titles of these people and what they did and, what the, and how badly they did it. A massive bureaucracy exists for safety cases, which they waded through, the MOD is the UK Ministry of Defence, BAE is British Aerospace Defence Systems, and Kinetic at the time was a part of the Defence Research Agency. So this is our, our best, and this was the result of the public inquiry. This is what the, um, the judge said. Uh, I'll just read this. The Nimrod safety case was a lamentable job from start to finish. It was riddled with errors, it missed key dangers, its production is a story of incompetence, complacency and cynicism. Surely we can do better than that. Panic and proportion. Uh, we had an uh, epidemic of swine flu in the UK a number of years ago. The newspapers grabbed hold of this, and I remember sitting on a train into London reading the local magazine, and it was saying, millions will die. That was the headline. Millions will die. Uh, don't, under don't understate it then. There was a massive overreaction, and this was stoked up by the media. The diagnosis rate in the UK was 10 times the normal because of remote diagnosis, which was brought in to deal with massive overreaction. And even knee infections were being diagnosed as swine flu. And meningitis, which is an extremely dangerous thing. Um, Tamiflu, an antiviral, was given to children. It has nasty side effects. We were giving it out like sweets. Why? Because the whole of this was based on opinion. No evidence. There was evidence, and it was presented by the medical community, but it was completely ignored. So what chance have you got as software testers when we don't even have the medical evidence, evidence base? So this leads me to a, a frightening new bureaucratic weapon, which is risk assessment. And in fact, risk assessment has an equation, which I'll give you here. Uh, it's R equals F times C. Uh, the perceived risk is the frequency of occurrence of an event times a measure of how catastrophic it is in some sense. OK? So unlikely catastrophic events have a similar risk to very frequent uh, non-catastrophic events. And, of course, mathematicians are always seeking to quantify risk, not very successfully. Now, this is how you detect risk assessors in the wild. Uh, first of all, you'll f this is a heater. So you'll find it's called a machine. And, of course, heaters are hot when you switch them on. So a risk assessor will actually put around this. This machine is extremely hot. I I've got quite a lot of these things, which taken over the years. Um, However, risk assessment has a fundamental problem. You've all, all probably been asked to do risk assessments for this and that and the other. Risk assessment requires measurement. It requires a knowledge of, uh, of pre and post uh, a priori measurements of how often these things happen. It never involves them. They're just people sticking anything down. Um, for example, uh, the risk of the end of the universe is definitely less than 1 in 10 to the 5, and that's the risk factor of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. You'd be very pleased to hear that, I'm sure. And then, 
you see something like this. If a guy tells me that the probability of failure is 1 in 10 to the 5, I know he's full of crap. That's my Nobel laureate physicist. So we have real problems with trying to assess uh, what risk even means. Because most of the time, it's not risk at all. It's called uncertainty. That's when you don't know either. So uh, if, the, as a public service, uh, this is how to write a risk assessment so you don't get asked again. First of all, insist on using R equals F times C. Uh, this will panic human resources uh, because you, you go into human resources to avoid multiplication. You then say, put end of universe as risk number one because uh, the rationale behind this is that the frequency of occurrence of the end of the universe is less than 1 in 10 to the 5, but it's not zero. But the, catas the, cat the catastrophic effect, of course, is infinite. So a small number times infinity is infinite. So step three, ignore all the other risks as insignificant, <laughs> and then uh, wait for the call from human resources. <laughs> um, there you go. Thank you. Um, I used to do my faculty's risk assessment, and I did this because I was a bit annoyed about the whole thing. And they rang me up and said, um, Professor Hatton, we don't think you're taking this seriously. And I said, I take the end of the universe very seriously. And it went no further. So there you go. It may come in use. Um, on to the subject of what I'm saying. Uh, I'll just pause for a moment and say, be careful with bureaucracy because it's very often so invasive it prevents you doing a proper job. Um, this was never more evident than in the crash of the um, Nimrod in Afghanistan where a huge bureaucratic leviathan failed completely because it was just done incompetently, the whole thing. So please be very careful about this. And if you're told to do things, you really do need to question what the value is and what the evidence is. At the moment, the evidence is not good for anything because we, we're not an empirical discipline, but we should be. Um, so let me try to give a little bit of empirical feedback. And I'm going to use one specific uh, example, a case history uh, of untestable components. And the case history is the Toyota unintended acceleration bug uh, in, which ran from 2009 to 2013 in the USA. It was extremely expensive. Um, in the end, Toyota paid $1.1 billion to avoid any future prosecution in the US. So this is a serious bug. In red, you'll see what NASA and a couple of other organizations who looked at the code said about the code. And these are, quote, bad things. So for example, uh, there were more than 11,000 global variables. Uh, if you look at in-car software, the whole damn thing is full of global variables. They're all full of it because it's a quick way of doing things in embedded systems, and it's just stayed that way. However, it was signaled out as being bad. Spaghetti code, 67 function, cyclomatic complexity, by the way, is a fancy name for the number of decisions plus one. So as a tester, you'll know all about decisions uh, because you have to test them. Um, cyclomatic complexity is simply the same thing. And it was specifically said in this experiment that 67 functions had more than 50 decisions and one had more than 100. That's really bad. Well, maybe. A um, couple of other things which we believe might contribute. But as it happened, the bug that was found was none of those. So in court, these things were presented to say, this software is bad because of this, this, and this, and this. But that wasn't the bug. So the question is, are these bad? Do we have the empirical basis to determine this? 
or are we going to continue repeating all the old stories stretching back into the folklore of software engineering? Um, in testing terms, we often use 10 as a watershed. This is a paper written um, uh, 41 years ago by Tom McCabe. Um, and it's still, it's still there. You still find it written in specifications and stuff. So I'm going to investigate this. And um, when you actually look at the Toyota case, uh, what you feel is that the whole thing is a kind of a mishmash of folklore and things that sound quite kind of, well, maybe they're bad. But this was a court case on which billions of dollars was riding. This is not good enough for systems. It's clearly got serious concerns. But let me go ahead and ask two questions. Why do we get big functions? Why do you see big components in the stuff you test? Second. Is it easier to test 10 functions with 10 decisions or two with 50? There aren't any answers. All of these years of fiddling with systems and the most basic questions we don't seem to have answers for. Well, I can give you some answers for these. A lot of other things I can't. It takes time. So let's just look at this. I'm going to start with a box of beads. Um, About eight years ago, uh, by the way, never let me estimate the time for anything. About eight years ago, I decided to take three months to solve one of these problems. Uh, I was leaving my academic job. I thought, I'll have plenty of time now. I shall sit down. Uh, I'm a mathematician by training. I shall go back to basics, boxes of beads, my pretties, and um, try to solve one of these problems, because they're pretty fundamental, really. Um, why is a box of beads relevant? Well, this is just like software. If you look at these beads, uh, if it's software, each box is a component, say a function. And the number of beads in it is the number of bits of program you're dealing with. We call them tokens. And the colored beads are different kinds of token. You know, the purple one might be an if statement. Uh, the pink thing might be a round bracket. So these are the bits that we make our programming languages, our systems, and of course in any reasonable system, we'll have hundreds of millions of these things. Okay? It's also the same for the proteome. The collection of all proteins is built in exactly the same way. Each box is a protein, and each bead is an amino acid. Different colors of a bead are different colors of amino acid. When you get right down to this level, discrete systems start to look the same. And this was what I thought I would tackle, because one of the things that you see when you work in software systems for many years is the same patterns again and again. So, let's see where we get to. Can we put together a theory of a system which answers just those two simple questions and anything else we can get as a bonus? So we need to, to have a system which, a theory which is independent of what they do, the language they're written in, who wrote them, what technology they used, and how big they are. Now, let me take an example. This is a, um, a, a C function, for those of you who remember C. From this alphabet of 26 tokens, I can build this thing, uh, which is called a bubble sort. Uh, it's a famous piece of software because nobody ever uses it because it's so slow. But it's what we illustrate sorting with to new students. And you can see from the 18 unique choices, I can build a bubble salt algorithm which contains 94. So some of them have been taken more than once. This is all fairly basic. Where do we go from here? Well, I started doing this for three months. Uh, eight years later, 
uh, earlier on this year, I finally managed to solve it by realising that life really is just a box of chocolates. And the reason why it's a box of chocolates is because, as you see with this box of chocolates, on the left-hand side, that box of chocolates contains 22 chocolates. May, and it contains 12 unique chocolates. I'd like to remember that. 12 unique chocolates is an alphabet of 12, and the whole box has 22. So there's two of the gold wrapped ones that people fight over, and so on. It turns out, by asking the question, how many ways of arranging a box of chocolates are there, that that equation appears. I won't show you anymore, I'm sorry about that. But um, that equation appears, and that determines how all discrete systems evolve. Let me move on a bit. You can come back to that if you ever feel the need. Um, let's have a look at this. When you plot how, how many times a function of a certain length appears, you get a really, really interesting distribution. It's that thing there. And that says, along the bottom, how long they are, and the left hand axis says how often they occur. And what you see is this funny rounded bit, a weird pointed bit, and then a very, very sharp drop to zero. But that was built from 80 million lines of C doing all kinds of different things. It's beautifully smooth. Let's look at the same thing for proteins. That's 80 million proteins organized in the same way, and the length this time is in amino acids. They're the same curve. So we're definitely onto something. If we solve the equation I've just showed you, it does that. So, it would seem, for all discrete systems, there's an underlying principle which determines how often you get functions, proteins, whatevers, of a certain size. This is really important because it's not in your hands. If you want to describe this, it's the, the weird point of it is a sharp unimodal peak. But the rest of it is an incredibly accurate power law. Incredibly accurate power law. If I look at this one here, uh, you'll find that the power law uh, is, um, uh, has an adjusted R square fit of 0.9992. It's the, most, it's the closest thing I've ever seen uh, and this is built on a huge population of software, almost the same for the proteins. So, what this means is that you, the developer, you, the tester, anybody, has no fundamental control over the appearance, over how long functions are. You can't control it, all you can do is contain it or describe it. Now, if you remember, in the Toyota unintended acceleration bug, the court cases revolved around things like, oh, this function is it's evolved to be over 100 decisions. Isn't that bad? No, it's not. It's inevitable. How quickly does this actually happen? The left-hand side, I've just repeated 80 um, um, million lines of code in C. The right-hand side is called the cu cu complementary cumulative distribution function. Don't worry about that, it's okay. But that slope there is almost straight. And that is the signature of a power law. Now, what does this mean for you? Well, it means this. First of all, it establishes itself extremely quickly. This is 40 million lines of seven different languages and it's accumulated in 500,000 line chunks. And you can see it gradually equilibrates to that shape. It'll start again in a moment. See, see how quickly it goes? So basically, any, faced with any system, it's overwhelmingly likely 
to look like that. What that means is that this isn't... Oh, there we go. What that means is that um, if you look at this slope here, it means that in any software system, for every 11, 10 decision components, there'll be one 50 decision component. It's overwhelmingly likely you have no control of it. All you can do is identify it and hopefully bound its behavior. So we can answer the first question. What happens when you get a big function? You've got no choice. Have a think about this. The reason for this, by the way, is because that is a power law. Think about the heights of humans on Earth. There's seven billion humans. The average height of a human is about one and a half meters. Nobody on the planet is bigger than three meters. That's exactly twice the average. And the reason for this is because human heights follow the classic bell curve, the normal distribution, and it's exponential. It goes charging down to zero so quickly that nobody on Earth in seven billion people is bigger than twice the average. Power laws, in, contra in contrast to that, crawl down to zero. So for example, if I look at the world of proteins as we know them today, there's 80 million proteins in the European Protein Database. The average length of the proteins in all of you is 250 amino acids. And yet there are, amin there are proteins which are longer than 36,000 amino acids. And the big question in biology has been why are some proteins so long? And in computer science, why are some functions so long? They can't help it. It's as simple as that. We can say a little bit about defects. Um, in the middle of all of this stuff, I realized that I could approximate the way that defects evolve because if you throw defects randomly at a shape which looks like that, the defects themselves form a pattern. And the pattern they form is T log A. So very approximate, I've got a better approximation to this now, but very approximately the number of defects in an object is the length of the object in tokens times the log of its unique alphabet. That's more or less linear. Can we test this? Well, we can. The problem here is that defect data is still, after all of these years, pretty rare. 30 years ago, when I started talking in testing conferences, I used to pray for people to have defect data sets which they would share. 30 years later, we still don't have any. Or at least if we do, nobody publishes them. So you can see why bureaucracy has such a hold over what you do because we don't provide enough data and experiments to counteract it. Let's test this. There are a few data sets. The one I've used here is the Java Eclipse um, IDE. And it covers a number of versions of, the, uh, of this library. Uh, I'll just reference uh, Andreas Zeller, who uh, gathered all this data. The line there is the T log A line. This is the number of defects up the left hand side and this is the a plot of T log A in components. And you can see as time goes by the defect line gradually asymptotes towards T log A. There you go and it starts again. The reason why it's so wobbly at the top is because these are components with a lot of defects. There aren't that, many, that very many of those so the data is very poor. Down the bottom, there are lots of functions with one, two, three, four defects. So that in all of this chaos and these massive systems and the growing 20% a year, underneath 
there are patterns and there are patterns which we can exploit. So, let me go on to the second question. Is it easier to test 10 by 10 decision components or 2 by 50s? Well, what are we trying to do when we test? We're trying to find defects. That's the whole point of testing. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Because of the logarithmic nature, uh, the T log something or other growth of defects, it actually doesn't make much difference statistically. So if you are phased by a big component, rest assured that if it wasn't a big component there, it would be scattered around as other components somewhere else because you have no control over the defect distribution. You have no control over the size distribution. You are given it. So if you find a big component, it's natural. And don't worry about the cost of testing it, because if it, if it wasn't there, it'd be somewhere else. So, let me um, wind this down. Um, all of these things, I think, have a, an impact for you. Um, it's too easy to carry on um, operating to impossible deadlines or marketing deadlines, or the CEO says this, or somebody else says that. If we don't have some kind of reasonable empirical system for determining how we do what we do, and I mean by evidence, then we're lost. We'll just become an extension of social media, or anti-social media, as I call it. Um, I've been saying this a long time. I was hoping we would get get there a little quicker, but we haven't. However, it's really, really important that we exploit patterns wherever we can find them. That means more experiments, but there are things that we can find. But when you have systems growing by 20% a year, you need all the help you can get. Because of this, recalls due to defects are growing. Well, that's hardly surprising. We seem to be wallowing still in largely ineffective bureaucracy. Um, I used to start these talks by a long chain of this week's failures. I've given up. There's just too many of them. Um, we need to do a little better than this. Um, so I really hope your generation can do better than my generation did. Um, Fourthly, large components in a system are inevitable. Just as it's inevitable that nobody on Earth is taller than three meters. It's just a statistical property of the material that you deal with. They are not a sign of poor design. And finally, and I'll say probably on this, Large components do not seem to add to our test load. Because you have no control over how components are distributed in the system, if you didn't have them in front of you in a 50 decision component, they would simply be somewhere else in other components, just as likely to fail. So we mustn't be frightened of them, but it's still a monumental test challenge to take, a, say, a component of 200 decisions and try to test it. Well, what, what on earth does that mean? Well, you can't really, but you can bound its behavior. And you may well be able to isolate by design any failures in that components. In many of the systems that fail in practice, for example, in automotive systems, um, you can highlight a particular subsystem and say, uh, if we have a, bi a, a big component in there, which has not been really bounded by testing, we have a serious problem because it has so much of an impact on the system as a whole. And of course, that's what, that's what testing is about. Your users don't care if this function is tested or that function is tested or this function is tested. They care if the system as presented to them does, roughly speaking, what they hope for. I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you have a wonderful day tomorrow. I'm sure you will. 
learning lots more about this. And uh, thank you.